It seems that for the second year in a row we've had an Australian Grand Prix that was a bit of a meme, although at least this time we've got something slightly different to talk about. Last year was an embarrassment, one of those occasions where it seemed like for yet another time Formula 1 had gone for the last lap sprint, or last two lap sprint, and it all kicked off on the final restart. So that race ended behind the safety car, whatever happened. I know a lot of people were quoting that old adage for the show as it was WWF1 or Formula Netflix at its peak. But this year we had something happen that went a little bit differently and it caused a lot of discussion on track and off it at the same time. In practice, Alex Albon wiped out and utterly trashed his car. It's one of those things that happens, mistakes are part of the sport. So long as the driver isn't hurt, then, well, that's the most important bit, isn't it? If you've got an injured driver, then you have a problem, especially when Albon is clearly the better driver of the two Williams drivers, and he's on the other side of the planet, so you can't really get a replacement out in time. The accident happened here on the exit of Turn 5. Albon got onto that Astro turf on the edge of the kerb, and he lost control. He didn't actually touch grass like most F1 fans on social media should probably do, but he still got a tank slapper on. Although a tank slapper isn't the actual operative term here, but it's what they call it. It is what it is. It was very reminiscent of when Bottas shunted back in 2018 or 2019, whenever it was, when he had something similar happen on the exit of Turn 2 in qualifying. But the end result was the car smacking into the wall on the right and then back across the track to the other side and spraying carbon fibre over the immediate postcode. Funnily enough, that's the same corner where Russell binned it in the race and ended up partially upside down. Now this is where things get interesting because it turns out that Williams didn't have the spare car with them in Australia, which opened up a whole new discussion in the immediate aftermath, or when people in Europe woke up to find out what had happened at least. In the good old days when cars were dressed up like cigarette packets and back in the days when Williams was winning, Sag, teams travelled with three cars. One car for driver A, one car for driver B, and a third car. This was often called the spare car, the third car, the test car, the T car, depending on who was speaking. The T car could be used from anything from a test mule to break in a new engine, test a new gearbox, run a new aero package, and it was, at least at the time, more convenient for the teams to have the third car there with this new aero package on for, you know, just a random example here, than it was to strip down one car, apply stuff, and then strip it down and revert to how it was if that new stuff didn't work properly. Or it can be used as an opportunity for a driver to get back into a race if his car is wiped out at the first start and that start is null and void. So it was basically there as a backup plan, insurance policy, whatever you want to call it. And all the teams had one. Didn't matter if it was the rich boys like Williams, McLaren or Ferrari, or even the minnows of Minardi, Arrows or whoever. Now some teams might not have had one if they were really cash strapped. Life, for instance, they only had that one chassis for the whole season, Andrea Moda too. But even Tyrrell in 1998, when they were at their most broke, had one. Toro Takagi used it at the Belgian Grand Prix when he was involved in that multi-car pileup at the start. And actually, this is something where the spare car could cause some issues. They only had one and if two drivers were wiped out then it was down to the team who got the spare in that instance with the 1998 belgian grand prix four drivers couldn't take the restart because the car had been allocated to their teammate for whatever reason the Stewart was given to verstappen because barrichello sustained minor injuries and the other three that didn't take the restart were panis in the prost Salo in the arrows and rosset in the tyrrell and this could all be down to drivers and relationships and politics and sponsorship and things like that. For instance, Ricardo Rossett at Tyrrell. That's well documented, especially the whole thing regarding Monaco 1998, which is something I need to look at in the future. People have been asking for the downfall of Tyrrell's story. Then you've got Pedro Diniz at Arrows. He had things like Parmalat sponsorship. He had, well, basically his dad's money. His dad owns the Brazilian version of Tesco or whatever it is. And then you've also got Olivier Panis. Okay, that one's a bit tricky to explain, but when you look at the qualifying standings, Trolley outqualified Panis, so that might be the reason there. At least that's the reason I'm going with. These days, the spare car travels like IKEA furniture that you've busted your back trying to lift off that shelf in the massive warehouse that you've walked what seems like 997 miles to get to. It's completely flat pack and this saves on shipping costs and remains flat pack until it is needed, all as part of Formula 1's current cost saving rules. It stops teams using that car as a test mule that we mentioned earlier. You can run three setups over three cars, pick which one works best and then copy it to the two race cars, if it is indeed the third one that worked the best. Long story short, Williams didn't have that car with them. Having a spare car physically built and usable in your garage to be used in the event of a restart or for other purposes was banned for the 2008 season, along with the banning of things like traction control. 
These days you can only have two built cars in your garages at any one time and, as already mentioned, has to remain in bits unless there is a reason for it needing to be built. In Albon's case, the car was destroyed. There's probably someone out there that knows who the last driver was to take the spare in the event of a null and void start, but it's not something I'm prepared to trawl through Google for. Although, I did find out some useful information as to how utterly mad that era of spare cars was. You know, just as a bit of extra history, trivia, story time, whatever you want to call it. I mentioned Schumacher and how he'd basically get the test car before Eddie or Rubens, and at most Grand Prix, he'd go out in one car, do a few laps, and then get out of that car, straight into the test car, and do another few laps. Literally, straight out of one, into the other, no messing about. So both runs would be done over the course of 15-20 minutes, just to see which car would suit him best for that particular Grand Prix. If you ever get to see some older footage of Grand Prix from back then, Murray, James Allen, whoever was covering the race, would often mention that he'd be qualifying in the spare car or something because that chassis suited the track better. The days when you could just spray money up the wall, just like that. I think there were a couple of occasions where he qualified in the test car, but then the other car was better over long runs, so it's just one of those things that used to happen. There was also a time, at least up to a point, where some teams would bring a spare car for both drivers at somewhere like Monaco. You know, just in case. Now speaking of Monaco, at the 1996 race, one of the 40s got destroyed and then the spare was destroyed, and lack of spares meant it couldn't take the start. Montermini, I think it was. Yeah, it was, because Badoa later wiped out Villeneuve. Now, why they hadn't got it there has been explained by Williams' head muscly boy, James Vowles. The Williams car this year was late, almost Ferrari 310 late, and as such didn't do the same shakedown runs that the other teams had done. Because the completion of the 2024 car had been done so late, they'd only managed to get two cars built. Ergo, no third car. Argo, Ben Affleck. Vowles said... As a result of the work that took place across the winter, we stressed the organisation to the absolute limits. We pushed everything as far as it could do, and what it meant as a result of that is off the back end of being very late on some of the production, the spare chassis completion date starts to move backwards. No team plans to come to an event without a spare chassis. In doing so, you create risk. In the absolute best case, it's uncomfortable. In the worst case, one of the cars is not racing, and that's the situation we face today. He followed that with, we have to ensure that we never ever put ourselves in that situation again going forward in the future. We are here to go racing and to only have one car here on Saturday and Sunday simply isn't what we're built to do. And all this as well comes off the back of the news that up until very recently, Williams wasn't using a database to inventory all of their stuff. They were using a spreadsheet. Microsoft Excel is great, I've used it a few times in these videos, whether that's for the videos where I visit a classic season with modern points or I need to make a chart of some description, or it can take a modicum of pain out of doing complex calculations. I still get PTSD from that live sound system design module and the acoustics module at university every time I see my copy of the Master Handbook of Acoustics. For adding, subtracting and calculating, it's a very handy tool. And for invoicing people. Williams was using Excel to do something that a database would have been way more efficient for, and they were actually using the spreadsheet to design the 2023 car. When Vowles joined the team last year, he was shocked to find that around 20,000 components had been logged on a spreadsheet that was not just extremely inefficient, but was later described as a joke. And I wonder if he thought someone was having him on when he first saw it. The reason it was such a pain in the ass to navigate is because of how complex a Formula 1 car is. A front wing isn't just a front wing, it's the main plane, it's the different elements, it's the end plate, it's this bit, this bit, this bit, this screw, this bolt, this bit here, this bit here, and 400 or so bits later, you've got your front wing. Having all that listed on a spreadsheet is going to be utter carnage to get through, and is going to cause a bigger headache than Mick Foley had after The Rock smacked him 11 times in the face with a steel chair in that I Quit match. I mean, yes, you can have multiple tabs, pages, whatever you want to call them, on a spreadsheet, but when you need to track all those smaller individual parts and then tick them off one by one as they're done, you see where this gets insane? It's going to be even worse when you're a Formula One team of all things, and precision is key. And that's why today's video is brought to you by Slack. It's not actually brought to you by Slack. I wrote that in as a joke. I'm, I'm trying to be funny. But it shows how desperately Williams is in need of a modernization program. Their stuff is so behind the times and needs an update. 
a major update and it will take a while because of the whole cost cap stuff. While this stuff probably worked back in 1998, things have now advanced so far that that kind of thing isn't something that they need right now. Getting a custom database for all of that stuff? What's that going to cost them? Telephone numbers, I'm guessing. So with all that part of William's background problems, things need to return to how they handle things in Melbourne after Albon's crash. It was Albon's birthday at the weekend and his present was... Logan Sargent's car. I wish that was my joke, but Alex Jakes got there first. This caused a bit of a kerfuffle on the old Twitter sphere and comment sections up and down the land. Albon stacked it. Why should he get Logan's car? How does it work that Alex gets another go when he's already binned it? People who make supporting a driver their whole personality complaining just because they can. All that stuff. It was just one of those things, really. But this takes me back to an earlier part of this video. Because, as already mentioned, I remember the days of the spare car, the T car, whatever we're calling it, and it would be written into some driver's contracts that the spare car would be theirs, no matter what. The Ferrari spare car from 1996 up until 2006 would have most likely been Michael's and set up for him, and if Eddie or Rubens ever needed it, then they'd have to cope with how it was set up. If both Ferraris were done in a crash, you can absolutely guarantee Michael would get first dibs. A similar thing happened in 1986 when Mansell was taken out on the first lap of the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch. The spare car was PK's and it was set up for him. Mansell took that car that was set up for his teammate and had been given to him contractually and then won the race in it. Although an asterisk does need to be added here because that contractual number one status was claimed by PK to have been done verbally with Frank, but then Frank had his car accident and it made things a bit complicated. So for Williams, nearly 40 years later, there's a bit of a dilemma. Do they give the car to Alex even though he's already binned it? Do they keep it with Logan because it's Logan's car? Or do they give it to Alex because he's the better of the two drivers and more likely to score points? Which then left an open goal for them to be abused in comment sections when Albon finally finished that race in 11th. I mean, sure, there's, what, 21 races left now? Albon, if he did sit out, would have 21 other opportunities to take a point or two. But it's a case of what's going to happen later on in the season. Williams was probably taking a gamble on a late race safety car in Australia, a red flag or that sort of thing, and it could have left Albon in a position to take a point or two that could mean the difference later on as Williams plays a very long game. But on this occasion, he just missed out. But hopefully, Williams will have learned a very valuable lesson here. Get things updated, enter the modern world, and just get things with the times. But they're not the only ones that have done this. Alpine were found to have been using a spreadsheet in a similar fashion a couple of years ago. And, well, I mean, Alpine's a bit different, isn't it? They're a big manufacturer while they're owned by Renault. Williams is still an independent team. It's just... I, I, it basically just means that Vowles and Co. just have a bigger job on their hands than they otherwise thought. So then, a look at what happened with Albon's crash, getting Logan's car, and the utter insanity that is the spreadsheet meme. Basically, a thing that has happened, and my opinions on that thing. So if this thing has made you think things about the thing, like this thing so I know a good job was done, and click the like thing and the subscribe thing, followed by the bell thing, if you want to see any thing that I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help support me at a more personal level, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces that you might want or need to know. Well, there's super thanks and memberships if they float your boat. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and goodbye. <laughs>